Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody You're listening to the Confessionals Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is contact at the That's contact at the confessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member. Members will get access to membership episodes that come out every Thursday. You get the Tuesday shows ad-free, and you get access to the overtime segments when they're available on the website and the Confessionals appy. So if that interests you, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member. All right, this week we have Juan from the Juan on Juan podcast coming on to talk homunculus. What is homunculus? It is an alchemical formed being. It goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years, and we speculate that not only are they ancient and have been used throughout history, including biblical times, but they are also being used in modern times throughout politics, entertainment industries. We go in on this idea of the homunculus and the idea that it could be connected to the Nephilim and all these different aspects to think on. And I know you guys are going to enjoy this conversation. So let's get to the alchemically formed beings known as homunculus with Juan from the One on One podcast right now. All right, today we got Juan from the Chosen One from One on One. How you doing, man? Tony, thank you for the invite. I'm doing all right. Glad to be here, man. I'm excited. Yeah, so uh Joel from Van Tesla and Kill the Mockingbirds kind of hooked this whole thing up. It's been a work in progress because of schedules, but um, he's like, I remember him sitting in the studio and he's like, hey man, listen, I got to tell you something. You got to talk to Juan, man. You got to talk to Juan. He's going to blow your mind, man. He's got so much stuff. He'll blow your mind, man. Every time we talk about Juan, it's always, he's going to blow your mind, man. He's going to blow your mind. And so like, I'm like, okay, what's he going to talk to me about? And he's like, yo, he's got this whole talk about this homunculus, the homunculus. I'm like, the homunculus is like the, the homunculus. Yeah, yeah. He's going to blow your mind, man. The homunculus. I'm just like, what the heck is a homunculus? And he's like, it's going to blow your mind, man. I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind. I'm just like, yo, what the heck? And so- shout out to Joel. Yeah, shout out to Joel because, and and he's like hyping me up. He's been hyping me up for months. I'm like, dude, if I go on there and I bomb, Tony's never going to forgive you for that one, dude. No, it's, it's cool, man. Like, I, I listen, he said it so many times that like, and I trust, I trust him, you know, I trust Joel. And he said it so many times. I'm like, this has to be good. And uh, I, I've been, I've been, you know, kind of, 
observing you from a distance and stuff over the time. And, you know, you've been growing and stuff, man. So like you obviously are doing well and people are digging what you're talking about. Uh, but when we were texting uh, back and forth and we were talking about this homunculus stuff, uh, I, I, uh, I told you, I was like, I have no idea what it is and I don't want you to tell me now. I want you to tell me on the show. <laughs> and, uh, and you're like, man, I've been doing this for a long time. I can do it. And I'm just like, let's go. So uh, I told you I was going to open up with this question. I'm going to do it. I'm still going to do it. Juan, what the heck is a homunculus? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to get weird on this episode. And I know this is the podcast to do it. So it depends on who you ask. But we can start off with the word, what homunculus means. Homunculus means miniature man or little man in Latin. Okay. But what a homunculus itself is, the one that I mostly focus on, is the alchemical homunculus from the 16th century that was introduced into history by Paracelsus. And Paracelsus is an interesting character because he's the father of toxicology. And a lot of things that we use today in modern surgery are attributed to him, except he was a little bit crazy. He was cuckoo, right? So he had a lot of different ideas. And one of those was the idea of elementals or nymphs or dwarves or giants. And he had this idea of a homunculus. Now, the homunculus is an, al an alchemically created little person, a magical little man. Okay. And what really, what really interests me about history is that these are actual concepts. These are things that people were talking about and not just any regular people. Like I said, the father of modern day toxicology was talking about creating in a lab. So pretty much think of a, like almost like a test tube baby essentially is what it is, but in, a, in an alchemical vessel and you grow a man into it. And then you are able to use this little man for magical purposes. Depends on which recipe you're following, but essentially you're able to do things with this little person. Some people have dissected, it, dissect it, whatever, or you can let it grow into old age. It'll divinate for you. It'll do, it'll, it's magical so it, because it comes from magic, from alchemy. And essentially that's what a, what a homunculus is in the alchemical sense. Now, the, the homunculus has taken an, an evolution throughout history. The, fa the father of her heresies, what's his name, Simon Magus, boasted about having a homunculus too, right? So we have the idea of the homunculus back 2600 BCE, and it just it really evolves throughout history. And it's just a very interesting topic because I found that it relates to a lot of things in today, it even relates to cryptids. It relates to all these different things because alchemy to me is a, what I call an interdimensional topic. It exists on various levels. It's an actual practical art. It's a psychological thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it exists on different realms. And the more I look into it, the less I truly really know what it's all about. But essentially, a homunculus is a little man created through magic who also is magical. And yeah, I don't know where else you want to go. With. That's wow. essentially in a nutshell what a homunculus is. Now, that, mind you, there's various ones. And the one that I think people are going to be most familiar with without knowing that it was a homunculus is a voodoo doll. Okay, we've all been shown in Scooby-Doo and all these different movies throughout Hollywood that a voodoo doll is a simulacra. It's a representation of that other person. And whatever you do to this simulacra, right? The homunculus, either made out of wax, wood, whatever it is, affects the person on the other side. And I think they're doing something similar today nowadays with our information that we give to them. There's all these sentient world simulations. So I think, Tony, that they're making virtual voodoo dolls and linking them because where's our data going? You know, they're doing all these simulations. They don't know who they're selling our data to. So they're, they're building a replica of you in some AI computer. Have you seen the newest Black Mirror at all? Uh, I've, I've seen some of the episodes. I don't think I've seen the, the newest episode. The first one is about how they're, they're able to build out the life of a person. But the thing is that they have realities laid on top of one another and they reveal this yeah. in these. In these shows, so I call them cinemagicians, where they're so they're sorcerers of the subconscious because they're planting things on our subconscious and they're kind of giving you hints as they go along. But essentially, they're built. That's what I believe they're doing today. They take our data and they build this virtual voodoo doll 
And whatever happens to that, that right, like Neo in the Matrix, whatever happens to Neo in the Matrix, which by the way, Neo is a homunculus. He was artificially grown in that pod. And then when he breaks out of the Matrix, he's an actual being. But inside, whatever happens to him inside happens to him outside. So think of it that way. And that's sympathetic magic, the law of contagion, like attracts like. So whatever. And mind you, this is, I talk about this a lot because on my show, I focus on the occult or esoteric alchemy and occult symbolism. It doesn't matter if you don't necessarily believe it because the people who are in power are the ones that believe it, right? And they're able to exert through, I, I get emails all the time. I mean, not as weird as your emails, but I get emails, people asking me like, hey, should I try this? Like, dude, I've, <laughs> I've had people email me that, th- that they believe that they are homunculi. And like, what are they supposed to do? And I'm like, listen, I I'm not that guy. I'm just here to talk about interesting stuff. I'm not going to, I've had people hit me up to break curses and all these stuff. I'm like, I'm not your guy, dude. Don't hit me up for that. And if you're a homunculus, I don't know. I don't know what you should do. I mean, you're, you're magic, essentially. I don't know, but it gets really weird. But essentially, I think that's what they're doing. And even Aleister Crowley wrote about the homunculus. Jack Parsons, the father of modern day rocketry, tried to manifest a homunculus with L. Ron Hubbard from Scientology. So we have people who are high ups in society, right? Higher ups, right? That are either notorious and that they use these, what I believe is a technology. Tony, I think that they're tapping into something that that they understand and, and they've changed it, right? They've changed it. And it's funny because Paracelsus, he had this, this race of this other monster that he would create uh, called an, an Enoch Diana, an Enoch Diani, I'm sorry. And it's a mixture of Enoch and Elijah, which I know you're, you like the Enochian magic aspect of it, but he, it was like these other little beings. So we have this guy, the father of modern day toxicology, talking about spirits, elementals, dwarves, mystical creatures. And he said that if you let a homunculus grow into old age and released it into the wild, it would grow into a magical being. So I'm like, I'm thinking, right, I'm like Bigfoot, dog man, like what's going on? So again, I'm not saying that they're all homunculi, but I think that some of them, and I have other stuff that we can talk about that attributes these cryptids that we know of to some sort of alchemical processes or alchemical creations. Mind you, because they're tapping into it. Now, do I believe that there's another existence or reality in which they exist? Absolutely. But one thing about alchemy, dude, is that you can also, once you achieve the magnum opus, which is the great work, the creation of the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life, because alchemy gets into immortality and it also gets into interdimensionalism because once you achieve the magnum opus, the light from that chemical reaction changes your DNA and you're able to step outside of reality. And you're able to manipulate your reality from the outside. Well, this sounds like a whole bunch of woo-woo, but because of alchemy, we have chemistry. So because of the practices that these alchemists of old were doing, the ones that were involved with the homunculus and all these crazy ideas, because of what they were doing in the lab, we have chemistry. Okay? So it's like one thing lays the foundation for another. So from the woo-woo, we get the science or seance, as I like to call it. (laughs) <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the science or the seances. <laughs> well, when you understand the root of it all, I mean, it's not that hard to draw a uh, a connection there like that. So homunculus, it, it's it, the definition of homunculus it has kind of varied over years is what I'm gathering. And like, because you even mentioned like how uh, 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 Neo is a homunculus. I mean, it, it, He's not little, but he's a magical person. Uh, mm-hmm. And so in that vein, and, and we can get into any topic you want, man. Like, I just wanted to jump off the homunculus, however you want to weave this. Um, <laughs> but in that vein, you know, and this is going to get, this is going to marry the woo-woo, uh, which is, you know, like my middle name these days, to uh, the conspiracy. But do we have politicians that are walking homunculus? You know, like, like I, I listen, is cloning possible? Anybody who says cloning isn't possible is living in 1985. Okay. It's very possible. It's been done. It's been admitted to. 
I have been on websites that have been sent to me by by people uh, that uh, advertise human cloning. And so, um, yeah, cloning is possible. Now, is is the is it a possibility to to clone a person to be a homunculus, or how does that work? So, as recently, they had an article come out. I think about a month ago where they admitted to, and cloning is absolutely real. I don't know if you've seen the latest They Clone Tyrone, but in, in that movie on Netflix, right? These wizards on there, they put a lot of truth in there. Now, about a month ago, they put out an article stating, number one, they've passed for us to be able to eat clone meat, clone chickens. Okay, so we can eat those now. The FDA passed it. And they also passed, they, they also put out that they are artificially creating artificially creating embryos. So without a man, male or female, they're artificially creating them. Now you have also this conspiracy. A lot of elites, a lot of celebrities use surrogate births. Now, mind you, I don't want to disrespect anybody. I'm just, I'm speaking on the literature. This is history. This is from, from the 15th century, from way above. So the idea of not having a woman within the, the, you know, the, the life giving process was a thing because they were products of their time, right? Women were looked as inferior in their time. So they were like, Hey, you know, the, the, the seed of man is magical. So I don't need a woman. I can, it, it, you know, if, if I put it in a woman and I can make a baby, well, what happens if I take the matrix, which is womb, and I switch that out for something else? Now they would switch it out for an alchemical vessel, for a cow, for a monkey, for all these different things. Mind you, this is in the literature of this thing. And the idea that you're talking about that there are people who are homunculus, right? Politicians that some of them like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or or Zuckerberg who don't really look human. They kind of look like like androids, right? They kind of look weird. Well, that's not too far fetched because Crowley, the so I told you that the homunculus has transformed or transmutated from the first that the time that it appeared all up until history. Well, in the 19th century, in the in the 20th century, I'm sorry, Crowley wrote about moon children and how to create moon children. And he took the alchemical homunculus and completely switched it up and was like, listen, up until the second month of gestation, there's no soul in the fetus. So what if we invoke a soul into that fetus? In a ceremonial setting, right? We have a man and a woman astrologically aligned. This is all in the literature. You can look all, you, anyone who listens to this can look this up. He wrote a book called The Moon Child in 1916. And in that story, because I believe that stories serve as a vessel for truth, right? And these magicians occult real, right? Based on real events, they occult real things that happen in real life under stories because the, the mixing of stories of fiction and and reality does something okay and the sub and we can talk i'd call that interdimensional literature we can talk about that but this idea he took this story of these two lodges fighting over an unborn child and he wrote also about creating and he admit he admits to that secret organizations have the knowledge and how to create homunculus and i just did an episode on this actually so he admit now is secret organizations, the OTO that he was part of, MI6 or whatever he was, because he was supposedly a, a spy too. We don't know. Or is it the government, right? Well, who, who is it? But secret organizations have this knowledge. And essentially, in a ceremonial setting, they copulate, they do the do, and they're able to invoke whichever entity they want into this fetus. And a regular baby is born, except it has the essence or the spirit of this entity. Now think about that. The world is a stage, right? Every man and woman has its, their interests and, and exits. So what I believe they use this technology for is to play out their their myths, their mythologies, right? It's always about the two brothers that are at war with one another, one another, one unalives the other, right? So what if they're able to play that almost like a King Kill thirty three, where they they snuff that light out and they use that energy for something else. Any exchange of energy, Tony, is alchemy. The mon monetary system is alchemy. We're exchanging energies. And if you trace back the origins of the monetary system, back to the Knights Templar, well, who were the Knights Templar talking to? 
Baphomet, right? You have the idea about, well, Baphomet is also sort of homunculus because they invoked an entity into the supposed head of John the Baptist. Okay, so you have that mythology. And that thing prophesies to them on how to create the monetary system that we know today. They essentially used outside influences, astro influences, whatever it was, to divinate to them on how to create more wealth. So that's alchemy right there. And the idea of, of, of a Baphomet, you know, this entity inside this vessel, it's also referred to as fetishism, not the sexual kind. The original definition of fetish was the dwelling place or vessel for a spirit or entity. And then it's kind of weird, right? Because fetishes are weird things that people have. Well, they took that and in the late 19th century, they switched the definition. And I think that's on purpose because the, the, our, the word grammar, Tony, comes from grimoire. And a grimoire is a book of spells. And that's in the etymology of the word. I'm, that's not a conspiracy. I'm using, again, I'm telling you about the literature. You can, anyone can look this up. But yeah, absolutely. Are, do I believe that, there, you know, people always talk about the MPC theory, that there are people walking around that have no souls or inner monologue. No. Well, I think that the higher ups, that, that 1%, could quite literally be homunculus, vessels for the elites to use for their own magical purposes. So I, I think that's an absolute, that could be more real than having NPCs, even if it is in this magical woo-woo way, they believe it. So therefore, it's true. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I've said that over the years. I mean, it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what they believe. And uh, uh, in, in these realms, the, these communities that, you know, listen to these types of shows and stuff, a lot of people understand that, the, you know, uh, what well, I don't want to say understand, but uh, there's a lot of people that believe in the power of manifestation through thought. And so uh, it, it falls in line with that. Uh, we're talking to Juan from One on One Podcast. I'm not sure if I said that in the beginning, but I want to make sure I say it out now. Uh, people can check it out on Spotify, Apple, all over the place. But uh, Juan on Juan. So it's uh, J-U-A-N on J-U-A-N. I like to play <laughs> words there. Also, the chosen Juan as your screen name here. I think it's freaking fantastic. Now, um, Nephilim. Okay, so you're talking about this stuff. And my, you know, I'm a Christian. And, and, and like, I'm, I'm sold out on it. Okay, like I'm diehard. Like you, you're not like, you're not going to shake me off my foundation. Uh, now, when you're talking and you're saying about the, the this ritual that's basically overriding God's creation, uh, like it, it's it's literally like like what you're describing. And and I know there's lots of people that are Christians that listen to my show. Uh, their reaction is the same I initially had as you were saying. I'm like, how can that be possible? How can how can Crowley uh, override? literally supernaturally override the supernatural God in the middle of his creation. How is that possible? And I, I'm not the guy to say how it's possible, but I can say safely that it's been done before, you know, because that's essentially what Nephilim are. Now, it, now the overriding process was uh, at the genesis of co conception, because we're talking about fallen angels initiating the conception and they are supernatural in themselves. But Somebody like Crowley walking in a supernatural realm constantly, um, it kind of fits that bill as well, especially if he has those entities working on his behalf. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of setting the scene for you to kind of probably go in, a, in, a, in that direction. I saw you nodding your head when I brought it up. So uh, go ahead and uh, carry on, sir. <laughs> Shout out to Joel, right? Because he's all about the Nephilim. And the if you trace the origins of alchemy okay and you go back to the biblical time and not a lot of people know this tony but i was born and raised pentecostal christian okay so i'm oh, i'm with up. you on that i could <laughs> i consider myself a christian we're both puerto rican so it's like we got we got a little bit in common right so puerto rican yeah. pentecostals right and the if you trace back the idea of where alchemy came from it came from the fallen ones that passed the knowledge on right to the daughters of men and from there i believe and the reason i believe this that that noah was one of the greatest alchemists of all time and his his lineage because i am one that i study a lot of alchemy and i look at different alchemical plates and there's always references to you'll see noah's ark in one corner or you'll see the two animals lined up 
next to it, one another. And if you follow, again, if you follow the etymology of why these biblical patriarchs were able to live for so long, well, what if they had the secret, right, to the philosopher's stone, which would extend your life for X amount of years, right? There's a lot of references to the cornerstone in the Bible. There's references, right, Jacob's ladder, he put his head on a stone and had what? A dream, right? And then when he woke up, he anointed that stone. So what if that was a sort of, what if the right the philosopher's stone was something that was available around everywhere right before the before the flood or after the flood whatever it was just thrown around somewhere because there are legends of like the golem which is more of a, like the the proto frankenstein i'm sure everyone knows about that story and then that has its roots in alchemy because mary shelley and percy shelley allegedly were studying alchemical manuscripts and Right. If we think about the stories that occult true, true, you know, real life events. Well, what if Frankenstein was a nod at that? Like, oh, we, that's a story. Maybe we tried it behind closed doors. Who knows? Let's just try to story about it. But that comes from the idea of a golem. And a golem is a magical man created through words, through magic. So not in a, in a lab setting. It's more of a, like a supernatural thing where they animate a man through word and he comes alive, but it's more of a cybernetic AI type of thing where it's programmed to do one thing. And the reason I, I bring that up is because in the 16th century, Ju- Judai, Ra- Rabbi Judai Lo or Love, how some people say, it, he allegedly had created in Prague this golem that was meant to protect this Jewish ghetto. Now, the reason they say he was able to create this golem was because in the ground there in Prague, it's a very magical place. Supposedly, the prima materia, the material which you need to create the Philosopher's Stone is in the ground in there. And there's something called Moldavite. So apparently, it's like it's, it's a crazy thing where this, this comet or asteroid or something crashed there. And essentially, it's a crater. And it, when it broke up, it deposited all that Moldavite into the ground. So whenever he would scoop up and, and he molded this man, he was able to animate it because it was already in the ground. It was already there. So I think of in biblical times, what if it was like that? What if it was available everywhere? These fallen angels came down. We're like, yo, you know, we want to do stuff with you. We'll give you something in return for using you. You know what I mean? Everyone knows the story and we're going to teach you these things. Okay. We're going to teach you the, where you have two ball cane, which is associated with the furnace. Well, the furnace is also associated in alchemy. So a metallurgy, metalworking, that's all alchemy. Okay, so we have this biblical connection to, to alchemy, essentially. And again, I mean, if you want to follow that, that, that storyline, alchemy did come from these fallen ones. And the watchers who were watching, right up, so you have the book of Enoch. And in the book of Enoch, he goes up into this other realm, this other dimension, and is interacting with these watchers, right? These angels. But the watchers, though, the way I've come to understand is that they were watching the divine alchemist, right? The one, the source, God, transmuting reality into existence. So the word watcher takes on a different meaning. Like they were watching alchemy. They were watching reality be created into existence. Okay, because they looked at the philosopher's stone, and I I just recently translated an old book from an old alchemical manuscript from the fourteen something fifteen hundreds, and it's about apparently alchemists in the sixteenth and seventeenth century. They had this thing with the first books of Genesis, where they believed they were the greatest alchemical text to ever exist, and they would do commentaries on these books. Okay, so they were taking the Bible. And they were doing commentaries on how it was related to alchemy because in the book of Genesis where God is creating the world, well, to the alchemist, the philosopher's stone was sort of this, this, this little world, this mundus, they call it a mundus, anyway, a miniature universe essentially is what it is, right? And I, I translated one of these commentaries. I'm going to be putting out a video of it soon of the alchemical, the biblical alchemical perspective. That was going, to, and, and again, I'm studying this from. I want to get their own words for it. I want to get these people's original words and what was really going through their minds as they're writing these things down. Because I, I like to look at history from all points of views, right? 
And, you know, I consider myself a Christian, maybe not the best one, but again, I'm, I'm diving into these w- rabbit holes or wormholes, whatever you want to call it. And I want to study it from all views in order to get a full grasp on, on what this weird thing we call reality is. But yeah, they looked at the book of Genesis one and two as the greatest alchemical text ever. So it's like, what are these, are these guys reading between the lines? Cause I do think that the Bible is a powerful book. There's a lot of very interesting things in there. And the idea that in the story within the biblical perspective has alchemy in it, right? Because you have again, Simon Magus talking about having a homunculus. He boasts about it. You have Jesus turning water into wine. You have Moses and, and parting of the Red Sea. You have all these different things that are, are magical. It's magic. I mean, that, that, that's essentially what it is. It's like a Harry Potter, right? Where they're casting spells and doing all this stuff. So the idea that there's alchemy within the story, but then if we step it above that and think about maybe alchemical secrets or secrets of any kind occulted within the Bible itself, maybe not the watered down translations we have now, but maybe the original King 1611 King James version, where if we trace back the the conspiracies of who the potential editors of that Bible were, right? The original Bible, Francis Bacon, William Shakespeare, all these guys, and maybe they occulted some sort of secret alchemical knowledge within maybe that version, that first edition. That to me blows my mind. So that's why I want to get the perspective of all these other guys to be like, you know, when <laughs> that's how this, this is how it all started for me, Tony. When I first started my podcast, it started with me asking questions at church. Or asking my grandma and go, hey, what's up with the uh, book of Enoch? Why are they uh, leaving all the cool stuff out of the, the main Bible? And like, oh, mijito, don't worry about that. Right? Like, what do you mean? You know, I want to worry about it. So it's like when you tell a kid, don't do something and they want to do it. Because like, what does that big red button do? Don't touch it. Well, I want to touch the big red button. And that's how it started for me. And I'm just diving down these rabbit holes. And it's like. The more I look, the less I know what it is, Tony. Mm. You know, uh, when you are when you start diving down these rabbit holes, um, so like you said a couple times here that you consider yourself a Christian, um, and, and you know, like I, I I don't know how how you define things, but I, I go just off of Romans ten nine. Basically, you know, do you do you believe in your heart and confess your mouth with, that Jesus Christ is Lord? Um, that is the foundation, the cornerstone, if you want to say that, of the Christian foundation uh, of faith. Um, the so based off that, you looking into all this other stuff. Um, so one, some of the stuff I I don't think is should be a problem. I mean, like like you've mentioned Enoch several times, and that's been quoted in the Bible. Like that's that's quoted, um, and. And but I, I think that there are certain people, uh, like for instance, myself. I'm not like like I know that that's not my lane. Like Enoch, sure, but like going in and reading Crowley's work and things like that, people are like, "Oh, well, you should educate yourself so you know what you're talking." No, 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 no. Listen, there are certain things that I'm not supposed to do for me, and that's one of them because I'm an individual with my own individual characteristics, and I know for a fact. I'm I'm already fascinated by this stuff. I don't want to be. I don't want to put myself in a position. I'm like, oh, let me just see if I take this feather and slap it over on that thing and just say this little word. Just see what happens, you know. Like, like it, it, especially you know, people go through their spiritual ups and downs, their valleys and lows and highs. Like in a valley, spiritually, when you're in that and you're and you're looking in this stuff, it could be very tempting for somebody like me to 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 tap into it. And and I've had people on the show who are active witches who were studying to be pastors, decided to know their enemy and study the occult for that purpose, and they wound up becoming witches throughout the process. Uh, I don't want to take the chance of that happening to me. Oh, well, you don't think you're strong enough? No, I don't. I don't. Like, I'm being honest with myself. Like, I don't. I think that there are certain things I'm not supposed to touch personally. Uh, for you, though, um, you're, you're studying all this stuff. Have you ever felt like, hey, man, like, what if I just, you know, take this coin, top, pop it in that little bowl there and throw some tobacco on top of it and see what happens? You know, like, have you ever been tempted with that? Have you ever tried it? You know, let me know. So 
This is one of the things that my wife didn't like at first because my wife doesn't care about any of this stuff. Like she does, she could care less about Bigfoot, dog, man, all this. So she doesn't care about that. But one of the things that was really ingrained in me growing up, Pentecostal Christian, and not a lot of people know that, but the idea was to have respect for these supernatural. Because being in the Pentecost, I played guitar a lot of years in the music worship group. And I traveled around to like juvies. and all. So I saw th- I saw supernatural things. And you know, when the Holy Spirit is around, it's about to go. You know, you feel it like it's in the air. Like it's something that you can't describe. Yeah. You feel it. It's a real thing, right? For those are, oh, you know, no, you feel when, when the Holy Spirit is in the area. Okay. So where I draw the line is, it is very tempting, Tony. It is very tempting to be reading these things and going, okay. But I also know that a lot of these guys, Tony, lost their minds. And if if it if it does work, Tony, why did they all die broke, penniless, drug addicted, <laughs> with nothing else to show for it except their what well, they wrote a whole bunch of books? Sure, okay, that's cool. But one of the things I learned was to have respect for these things. The only thing I'll go as far to do, Tony, and I, I do it more to troll people, is I'll use the the numerology, if we will, in my in my work. So I have a comic book. My comic book is three dollars and thirty three cents. Like I'll do stuff like that. Maybe the font I'll do it thirty three. Woo! But bec- but because again, I've studied Pythagoreanism, and I know that numbers resonate on a certain frequency. And they, I, I think reality is all numbers. Okay, I think it's it's a mathematical thing. And the Pythagoreans worshipped number. Okay, they worshipped reality as numbers. So I'll, I'll do that just to troll. Okay. But I've had experiences, I call them gremlins. And I've had people tell me, you know, I have books all over the place, old books, rare books. And they've told me at my desk here in my office, right back again to this interdimensional literature, while books, I believe, are portals. They are portals that open up and are able to transport you to other realms. Your consciousness, they're, they're mandalas essentially is what they are. And you can hop in that, and go, you ever pick up a book and you just can't put it down because it's so good? Well, unfortunately, some of these occult books are just that. And I've had, uh, Tony, interactions where in the corner of my eye, you know, I'll see those, those, right, the shape of shadows, something moving around. And I'll, you know, sometimes you feel your mind wandering and I'll invoke the name of Jesus, right? In the name of Jesus Christ, I, I, I whatever's around, you know, I order you to, to leave in the name of Jesus. And I'll use the name. And it works. So there's something about that. And I've talked about this on my show before. There's something about that. that there's power in the name of Jesus. But yeah, I've never, you know, people ask me all the time, oh, you know, have you ever thought about making a monkey? I was like, oh, why? I, I find it interesting to talk about it and discuss these ideas with, with the like-minded people. But am I going to go out and do something like this? Probably not. So that's where I draw the line. And I've recently, <laughs> I recently had somebody reach out to me, somebody you know, about doing a documentary and they want to open up a portal. And I go, he's like, hey, you know, I want you to be a part of the experiments. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> do I want to, do I want to participate in this thing that they want to do? And I was like, you know, I'll be there as a consultant. Cause I get made, I'll get not made fun of, but I've had people, right? Like the people who, the haters, right? They'll be like, oh, how are you able to talk about this if you've never done it yourself? And I go, I, I don't care. I have the literature. I can read it and I can take somebody's word for it. And that's as far as I'll go. And yeah, my wife was worried about, I was like, oh, well, when you start going down these rabbit holes, because you said how you said it's, it's tempting, right? People feel that they get some sort of power from doing these things. And, and essentially, the idea of creating a homunculus is to extract and get godlike powers from this thing that you created. Okay. So it is absolutely what you're saying. It is blasphemous. It is heretical because they are trying to usurp God and become little God with a little, you know, a God with a little G themselves. Right. And, and again, I believe Tony that there are two camps behind the scenes right now. The camp that likes to create homunculus and extract the power from those homunculi or artificially created beings and the camp that likes to extract them from the real thing. Okay, if you, if you catch my drift, okay? The, the people who are, you know, we hear all these conspiracies with that substance that they extract from certain, from, from children and all this stuff, right? So I mm-hmm. think that there's two camps in the background, the camp that likes it from the artificial and the camp that likes it from the real stuff. Again, that's just 
something I believe, and I think that they're similar to the Moonchild story of Crowley. There was two camps fighting over that unborn child. So again, just just think outside the box, and you 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 start to put uh, you know dots together. You go, okay, now this is making more sense. But yeah, to answer your question, absolutely, some of the stuff is very very. You know, it can draw you in, but you have to know, you have to be strong to be able to draw the line. And I, that's where I draw the line. I'm not going to be sacrificing any chickens anytime soon. Yeah, no, Moloch can stay where he's at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we ain't about that life. Um, no, I. so you mentioned about the uh, the idea of books being portals. And that's something that I've been considering a lot uh, as I've, I've been kind of like, so... I don't study like you study or like other people study. The way I study, if you want to call it that in parentheses, uh, is basically talking with people. My brain starts working and all of a sudden I start pulling pieces from other things that I know and I start building a, a tap. It's a tapestry. It's a painting. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's evolving with every stroke of the brush. And um, it's not the most scientific at all, um, but that's just how my brain works. And, um, I, I've, I've, I've been, you mentioned Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder is something that I have been contemplating a lot. Uh, and it started probably a few months ago when I heard the story Jacob's ladder pop up like three times in like two days or something like that. And it's just like, it's one of those things where I was like, okay, maybe God wants me to look into something here. And so I sat down and I, I read it and I was reading through the whole story. And it wasn't until the end that I realized what I was supposed to see. And, um, you know, the story of Jacob's ladder, basically for people who don't know is that he, he finds a rock to lay his head down on and to go to sleep. And when he goes to sleep, he has this, um, experience, you know, the Bible calls it a dream. Uh, people call it a dream and, and I call it a dream, but I, I want to preface it with the idea that dreams, even according to the Bible, are way, 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 way more important than what we give it credit for in the Western culture and society. Uh, and I've mentioned this several times on the show, how my mind's changing a lot on dreams, but uh, and not all dreams. Like if, you, if you're being chased by Barney down the street, it's a dream. Like, like I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, maybe it has meanings to it, right? But uh, I'm not the dream whisperer, uh, but dreams are powerful. And, and even the Bible talks about it several times. Uh, we lose touch of all that stuff because we are the further we get into time on the Western society culture realm, the further away we get from the supernatural view of what our existence really is. And with this dream, he sees a, a staircase, uh, a ladder, if you will, going into heaven. And it, 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 it goes from him describing seeing this thing to what I envision him standing at the bottom of. I don't think he went up the stairs. It doesn't say he did, but the way I envision is all of a sudden now he's standing at the bottom of the stairs and there's God at the top and there's this, this interaction. And before the interaction, he sees this, this, uh, this stairs or this ladder and um, he says that there's angels ascending and descending. And I always just want to preface it because this is an opportunity for me to, to kind of just maybe give people comfort. Uh, the angels were ascending, then descending. And that should give you a very comforting sign that angels are here around us all the time, working on our behalf. And they go upstairs to check in with the big guy to make sure that whatever we're praying for is according to his will. And then they come back and they act on our behalf. And so it's not that they're, there with him, just watching our lives unfold and just, you know, waiting for him to be like, okay, he's suffered enough. Like they're here working on our behalf. Um, and, and that imagery is in my mind, in my heart, is proof of that. It gives me comfort. So I just want to share with other people. Um, but back on topic, um, he has this interaction and then he wakes up. And I don't have the scripture in front of me, but I believe it's the ESV version that actually uses the word that I'm going to reference here. He says that this place is the gateway to heaven. And that's at the end of the story. And when I read that, I was like, that's why I'm supposed to be reading this. Because swap gateway with portal. We did a whole episode for the members. Uh, I think I called it Biblical Gateways. 
And I had my friend Derek, who's a pastor, Pentecostal pastor. Uh, well, his dad's a pastor. He helps him. He's a pastor too. Um, but uh, he he came down from New York and he's in the studio and we're talking about this stuff. And he's laying out the the, the case for, you know, and he wasn't saying this is 100% or something. He's just like, it gives you food for thought. And so that that story is another story of the idea of a gateway. Now, um, take that and then zoom back and look at the Bible itself, not the gateway that's mentioned in the Bible, but the Bible itself, a gateway. And that's something that I started thinking about more and more with books and, and what's in these books. And the, the fact that you open this book and you dive into the information and it's now a gateway into this realm. Uh, and then I was at a conference. It's so unexpected how, how welcoming the people were at this conference of my viewpoints. But, uh, you know, they, they were talking to me about like, like I, I started, start, I started talking about all this this weird stuff that I talk about on my show, and they're just like, "Yeah, you know." And I'm like, "Oh shoot, I'm in my with my people." Um, but this pastor, uh, Robert Hodgkins, uh, I, I met with him and Robert Hodgkin, uh, and him and I just really hit it off. And that's one thing that he just like proclaimed in front of like all these people, like in this conversation. He's like, "The Bible is a portal," and I was just like, "Yes," you know. And so, like, I, I'm. I, I say all that to say, I agree with you, but books are, are portals. Yeah, absolutely. So. <laughs> no, and, and, and the scripture and, and ancient literature, in my opinion, if you think about the effects that it's had on humanity, on reality itself, I mean, that resonates. It, it's something that right started one thing and it just radiates outwards and has changed the world quite literally. So the, yeah, the interdimensional literature is something. And the idea of dreams being something, it's, it's very interesting. And the reason that they show that ladder of secret societies like the Freemasons use that symbolism for a reason. I think that they, that they know about it. If you look at, uh, David and Goliath, right? David allegedly, I did an episode with Joel uh, on the, uh, we called it the alchemical story of David and Goliath. And we speculated on what if David used a philosopher's stone to take out Goliath, right? This Nephilim, uh, because Nephilim are, they're part, you know, like almost like demigods, they're magical still. So he used maybe this, right? We were just speculating. We went down the, the story of it and how King David passed down some stones, the puck stones to Solomon and how Solomon, right? Solomon Shamir was also a substance or a worm, kind of weird thing. So there, and it's funny because Solomon asked for wisdom. He doesn't ask for money. Well, maybe because he already had access to the Philosopher's Stone where he could turn lead into gold and create wealth already. So he's like, I don't want more wealth. I just want wisdom. I want to know about everything. So there's that idea. And in the occult, I've noticed that the dream state is very important to them because in dreams, you yourself are you recognize yourself being there. You recognize that a part of you was in this other realm, or whatever it is, but you weren't really there. And sometimes I have certain dreams where I often wonder, I go, you know, I'll have an interaction with somebody that I've known or know. And it's so vivid that I often wonder if the person on the other side also interacted with me in their dreams and in, in that realm. Okay. So, and, and I'll wake up and I go, I wonder if that person, you know, they say when your ear rings, somebody's talking about you or whatever, when your hand itches, you're about to get money or, you know, those, those dumb superstitions. And I go, well, I wonder if somebody dream, if you seeing somebody else in your dreams is indicative of them also interacting with you, you know? Let me tell you, uh, bouncing off of what you're talking about here, um, I did an episode years ago. It was actually, I believe, removed off my podcast feed. Uh, for copyright infringement, you know, music and stuff at the end of it. Um, I think, but I have to have him back on sometime. Uh, but his, his channel is, uh, mixed Mr. X dreams. And, um, he talks a lot about dreams. Uh, I don't know what he's talking about these days, but, um, I know when I, him and I talked years ago, he was doing the dream stuff. And, um, he told on the show about how he had a dream where, he was actually exiting the dream as his sister was entering the dream in the dream. Like she was entering the room or whatever, and he was exiting. And, um, 
he wakes up the next day, he sees her. And she's like, I dreamt about you yesterday. And you were like walking out of a room when I was walking in. And it's like, like they, they was, there was a clear, no if ands, buts about it. Like they had interaction in the same dream. And uh, they, they recalled that together. And so, yeah, absolutely. And that's the, that's the bonkers weird side of, not weird. I don't want to say it's weird. It, it's it's un, unfathomable. We, we don't fathom it very well because of our preconditioned mindsets. Uh, dreams are fascinating. Um, going back to the David uh, and, and the, the, uh, the, the, what's the stone again? Um, the philosopher's stone? To, yeah, I keep wanting to say sorcerer's stone. I'm like, it's not the sorcerer's stone. Okay. Um, well, it could it's, be. Though. Yeah, same idea. Same idea, yeah. same concept. I, I will say this. Um, so Joel was telling me about that. And uh, him and I just talked the other day and uh, I was ta- telling him how w- next time he comes to the studio, we got to do a whole episode on it. So if you want to join us on that, you can um, for sure. I don't. I know you're in Florida and stuff, so I don't know what your situation is, but it's just on the table for you if you want. Um, but this is something that I kind of, and this is what I mean. Like you, you, Joel is doing this too. Like you guys read and you're, you're studying and all that stuff. Um, and my brain works different. So this is something that I've been on for at, at least 2017. Um, because I remember making Facebook posts about this back in the early days of me doing all this stuff publicly. I was really new at it. And I remember getting like people from my church commenting on it, like, what the heck are you talking about? You know? <laughs> and I'm like, God bless you and your family. Leave me alone. You know, like I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, in, my, I'm in my bag right now. You got to let me be. Uh, and so, but I, I and I, I pulled it up here and I just, I don't know how much I'm going to read of this, but I want to kind of just, just share this with people. Um, as second Samuel chapter 21, verse 16 through 22, it has here. I'm not sure if I'm actually going to read this whole thing right now, but uh, it says a, a giant and people have to understand, we talk about this all the time. Giants are, are throughout the Bible. If you're new to the show, Goliath was not the only giant in the Bible. Uh, it, it, that is a, a, a very, very under talked thing uh, in Western church, right? But it says a giant named Ishbib Benab, okay, very bad at reading those names, who was carrying a bronze spear that weighed about 3.5 kilograms and who was wearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. Now, when you, when you read that, you're like, okay, he was carrying a new sword, he had a bronze spear. But when we're talking about the alchem- alchemical nature of these things, possibly, uh, and you read and you dissect that verse, and I, I, we could probably keep reading, but that's the chunk that I, that I really wanted to share with people. Um, when the translators were translating the Bible, from what I've gathered, the word that is there that says sword was an implanted word because what it actually was saying, the, the word that they used, we don't have a word for that in the English language. Uh, but the idea of the word was that he was wearing something new and they planted so, sword in there because it makes sense. Just like um, there, there are parts of the Bible that like, in, I think it was the King James when they were translating, I believe it was a King James, um, and I don't remember the verse, I don't remember the book, but it, t- it talks about how um, we, we as humans are just, uh, we, we, are, we are below the angels, but the actual translation is that we're above the angels. Uh, I forget, I, I, that, that, that 30 second segue right there, friends, just disregard, but it's there. <laughs> just, if you want to dig, go ahead. But like, I, I, I forget, it just came to me. But anyways, Back on topic, uh, it, 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 the translations, you know, and if it was that he was wearing something new. So they, David, mighty warrior, right? And David himself, who uh, has seen battle immensely, uh, is familiar with every type of weaponry out there. If it was a sword, they would have, put the word sword in there because when you're when it's in, in second Samuel when they're writing this like um they're not, they're not dumb you know like like it, it's it's a it's a no-brainer so the fact that they the word they chose to use was something new and not a sword and when we translated the bible 
it's we're putting in sword because we don't know what the something new is. So we're like, it's probably a sword. You got to back up, take take off that 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 those those preconceived notions. Maybe put on uh, the the supernaturalist hat and say, what if the something new was some kind of new technology? Because it says here. After it gave the resume of bronze spear that weighed about 3.5 kilograms and who was wearing a new something, a new sword, thought he could kill David. Homie, like, David was a mighty warrior. They knew he killed Goliath. Like, he kills giants, right? He's not going out on the field uh, casually saying, yo, I got my 3.5 kilogram spear. I got my new sword freshly <laughs> sharpened, and I think but I can is. take on I can take on the giant slayer now because I got my new sword extra sharp. I think what happened is he walked on the field saying, "I got this new alchemical weapon," and, and, and use your imagination. Maybe it's glowing purple and shoots lasers out. I don't freaking know. All I know is whatever he had gave him more confidence to take down the giant slayer than a traditional sword would in his arsenal, and so that is just a a little, you know, segue of mine that, but this is something that I've been talking about briefly throughout the years. And I'm really glad there are people like you and Joel that are studying and going deep on this stuff. And, you know, we may not agree on everything. The audience certainly won't agree on everything you say, but it's definitely something to look into for perspective, especially people who are biblical, uh, you know, faith believing Christians who are listening to this, trying to fit this idea of a supernatural worldview in today's modern culture and society, it can be a very difficult thing because you feel like you're walking around crazy, like you're a lunatic. Like, what am I doing? Am I crazy? I'm probably crazy. Uh, you're not crazy. It's just you're desensitized to the supernatural aspect of your reality that you're living in right now. Rant over, carry on. One. <laughs> <laughs> no, as you were saying, like the translation, I was literally writing down original translation. And that's the thing. Uh, we, in the description of the episode that we did, me and Joel, we put what the puck is going on because the word, the puck stones, we don't know what they were. We don't know what the puck stones are. It's P-U-K-H, I think it is. And it's like, they refer to like David passing that on to Solomon, this, this, and this, and then the puck stone. What is, what is the puck stones? What is that? So how you're saying, if it was a sword, they would put sword. And and that's the problem with the translations too, because they're going to insert whatever makes sense, but they're referring to something else. And that's what I love about Joel, because he takes the original Hebrew and he breaks it down and he has the books to back it up. He's like, hey, listen, let's flip to this page and, and look up stone. But stone has 35 different meanings, whatever, you know, an example. And this other one has two different meanings. So therefore, and you know, you can make an educated guess from that. But even then, we still might not probably know what they're referring to, but I think if, if we are to follow this alchemical, this alchemical biblical approach to it, they could be talking about some sort of advanced technology that was alchemical in nature. And again, they were part Nephilim. And if we follow back the origins of alchemy, it goes back to the Nephilim, the fallen ones. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think that it's, it's an interesting, and that's why I translated that, that commentary of the first books of Genesis. Because I want to get these guys, even if it's a, even though it's a translation from Latin to English, I want to get their word for it. I don't want to take a scholar's work, a word for the, they translate just pieces of it and they put it in some essay or whatever. Like, no, I want to read the actual thing and I want to, I want to see what they were talking about. It, it, you know, even if I draw something from that or not, but therefore I can put that part of, you know, in my mind to rest. It's like, well, there's a whole translation. I don't even understand what it says. If I can't read old Latin, then I'm screwed, right? So that, let me just translate and take and see what it says for it itself. So yeah, absolutely. I'll take up your, your invitation for that. I'd, I'd love to sit down on that. We could, I mean, we, we go deep on that. We did an episode recently and, and we talked about it, but we only scratched the surface because there's so much of it. And uh, I have your escalator. So the escalator, it may, you know, Jacob's ladder, maybe it was an escalator. You think about the angels going up. And that's what I so, that's what I actually envision. When I think of it, that's what I think of. Like, like there's no effort. You're just kind of gliding up to God. It's like, thank you, yeah, Jesus. Just, <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to focus uh, some more on the dream aspect of it because the 
the homunculus concept really bleeds into all the stuff that we talked about. So the idea of having like this astral servitor or something, that's also homunculus. The Your imaginary friend that we all had as a kid, that's kind of sort of like a homunculus because the homunculus takes on, you know, it goes from metaphysical to like a meat and bones to then like a, another, again, metaphysical in like the 21st century if you want. And if you and I've linked it, Tony, to even like people in in recent mainstream news that had ranches in certain places, right? Zoro Ranch and all these different places where they were trying to impregnate thirty women at a time. Well, I wonder why they were trying to do that, right? So, and it just it links the Nephilim wanting to, right? Because it's funny the Nephilim are if they're able to interact with human women, that would kind of sort of mean that they kind of sort of have human DNA in them because they're able to interact with the women. So these Nephilim are sort of chimeras, which I want to segue into the chimera talk because it relates to alchemy. Because after they were done making rational animals, they would make irrational animals. And they were mixing birds with cows or monkeys with with dogs or whatever. And if we think about, right, the Nephilim, why did God flood the world? Well, because there was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of blasphemy. There was a lot of heretical things going on. You had the fallen ones interacting with the daughters of men. Well, what happens after they're done interacting with the daughters of men? Well, they start interacting with the animals, right? And they start inserting themselves in the animals. And we get these kind of these, the harpies, the minotaurs and all these different things. Well, one of my favorite topics, Tony, and I've been a fan of your show for a long time, so I'll, I'll tune in. And one of my guilty pleasures is, because you talked about gateways, is the Dogman and Cryptids and Bigfoot. And I went to Gatlinburg recently. I know you and I were chatting back and forth. I was in Gatlinburg, and one of the things that stood out to me was the sign, a gateway to the Smokies. And I go, oh, man, that's crazy because... If we take the concept of mountains, Tony, there is the Shugendo tribe from the ninth century is a, is a mountain worshiping religion. Now, it's fine. They worship the mountains. You know, we, we have the idea of the ark landing on top of the mountain, right? I forgot the name of the mountain, but we have all these ideas of mountains. Well, Crowley, right back to the Crowley, he was a mountaineer. But this specific ninth century religion, they believe that by climbing these mountains, Tony, they would acquire magical powers. What mountains? And they would become. Uh, so this is in Japan, but any gotcha, thing okay. you take into account why these elites like climbing Mount Everest or K2 or all these different peaks, right? We have all these the twin peaks and all these different logos on companies that use mountains and the sun and all these different things. Well, this religion from the ninth century, they believe that by climbing mountains, they would achieve magical power, like magicians in the mountains type of thing. And they would become shapeshifters. They would become, I don't know if there's werewolves, but they would become like this Japanese folklore. They would become like these weird, uh, I think they're like the redheaded demon looking things with the long nose. They would become all these different things. And I go, well, what if, again, not saying that this is what's going on in the Smokies or LBL or wherever it is, but in all these grimoires I've read, one thing stands out. And there's a, there's a, one aspect to the homunculus recipes that I've come across and that it always uses, uses magnets. And it, they refer to the magnet as the stone of choice for magicians. Well, it's funny because in Oak Ridge, we know that there's a collider, right? And that collider uses what? A, a, a large array of magnets as you use in the Hadron or Hydron collider, whatever, however you want to say it. At Oak Ridge. So there's stories of the portals opening up, right? And these things bleeding into our existence. Well, in the occult aspect, Tony, there are stories of that too. These other realms, these other dimensions that magicians are able to open up and let these things through into our reality. Now, the idea that perhaps the dog man or the Bigfoot or something is a sort of technology that they're tapping into, almost like an altered carbon where they swap their consciousness into this entity. They run around, they do their their shenanigans, whatever it is, and then they go back. Well, you have stories of that, like St. Augustine, 
who wrote the confessions and were on the confessional. That was funny. But he wrote a, a story about the city of God, right? Where due to their sin, they were all turned into werewolves and different being and birds and all these different beings, right? Well, we're starting to see this phenomenon more and more. We know that God destroyed the world when all these chimeras were. And again, I'm not saying that this, something's going to happen, but biblical times, right? And the first book I ever read in the Bible was the book of Revelation. Okay. And that book fascinated me because it's like apocrypha, Tony. Apocrypha. I was a 12 year old boy reading Revelation. Like, what is going on? <laughs> like, Bro. I know. Traumatizing. Okay. Traumatizing. Now it all makes sense. Now it all makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So you see where I could get the, you know, the dragons and all this different lore from. It was from that, right? I was introduced and that's the first book I went to because I was just fascinated by it. But we know that God destroyed the world after because there was cameras and all these things. Now we have all these, it feels like to me, more and more stories of dogmen and the idea of the dogman and Bigfoot, right? The Bigfoot's sort of like an ape type of thing. Well, the ape is also relevant in the occult because it's looked as a, uh, a liminal species. It's not fully man and it's not fully beast. So therefore it's one of the preferred species uh, of animal, right? The choice of animal for magicians because it exists in this liminal area, this in between man and beast, right? So what if again, talking about alchemy, combining different things together, maybe Bigfoot is a sort of alchemical Type of maybe some of them. I'm not saying that they're all these alchemical chimeras or cryptids, whatever, but some similar to the dog man. Because the dog man, according to some scholars, homunculus, okay, there was this battle of homunculi back then. Some scholars believe that homunculus were artificial demons that were birthed into existence. They had ethics on how to treat a homunculus back then, Tony. There are stories of alchemists that would create homunculi. And as soon as it came to life and would animate in the vessel, he would destroy it. And the other people around were like, what are you, what are you doing? I was, listen, I'm an alchemist, right? I'm, I'm practicing this and I'm doing this, but I don't know if God died for that homunculus of sin. Is God going to, did God die for that soul? Is God going to put a soul into it or a demon? And if you think of the concept of a dog man and the concept of dogs and the occult, right? you have Mephistopheles in the story of Faust showing up as a dog. You have the idea of dogs, uh, people reincarnating as dogs from a violent death, right? You have, uh, I've also heard that for apes too, but when people encounter a dog, man, it's almost like a demonic entity in nature. Like they, they don't ever want to see a dog man ever again in their life. And then Bigfoot, it's like, oh, I would love to see it. I want to go out and look for Bigfoot. Like they want to go out and look, but the dog man's like, no, I don't ever want to see that thing again. So again, this idea of these lycanthropes, maybe perhaps being, and, and the reason I bring this up, Tony, is because I was reading a book that I probably shouldn't be reading because people have told me, listen, that certain authors' books are portals. You got to be careful. They, I've, I've heard people, like people reach out to me. They go, hey, listen, dude, I know you don't like this occult stuff, but you're doing stuff that's kind of shady. Just watch out. And I was reading this Kenneth Grant book, which was Crowley's Assistant. And he's talking about traversing this other dimension, this other reality. And the crossing of the abyss is something that these occultists would do. Parsons did it. Crowley did it. And the, the, the abyss is this intermediate world that exists between reality and, and, and the imagination, if you will. And he talks about the reason for that is to let go of the ego. But in these, in these other realms, there's a dimension where time goes backwards. And these, occultists, they enter that dimension. And when they enter that dimension, they are trying to regress their, their brains and their ideas all the way back to a pre-human time. So I'm thinking Nephilim, demonic, whatever, like the, you know, pre-human, but that they sometimes fail, Tony. And that there's this dog-headed ape sitting there that looks at them as they struggle in this larval form is what he calls it. And they are tossed into the abyss. And then when I read that, I go, that's, that's some interesting imagery. He's got a little footnote there. And the little footnote says, attributed to most magical lycanthrope cases. So I go, wait a minute. What if this werewolf, and not just werewolves, you know, take anything into account. 
What if this is failed attempts by occultists to cross this abyss and they've just lost their mind and gone through some sort of alchemical transmutation, biological change within themselves because part of the dream state too, Tony, that I've read about is that some certain entities that reveal themselves in your waking state will appear horrific in nature versus when they reveal themselves in your deep sleep state. And now this is related to H.P. Lovecraft, right? Speaking of dreams, who was inspired by the, he was inspired this entire mythos of weird elder gods, the great old ones through his dreams, which I think were entities on the other side of space and time trying to be manifested through what? Through literature, through books, because books are portals to other dimensions. And you have H.P. Lovecraft, one of the most influential, prolific writers of all time, birthing, right? Homunculus, birthing things into existence through his writing from stuff that was revealed to him in his dreams. Okay. So to step this up, uh, let's go deeper, Tony. You have anything to say before we go deeper? Because I got some, I got some smoke, bro. No, keep I'm building keep it going. up. Um, <laughs> the, the, what you're saying about the, the books, dreams. Yes. Absolutely. And, and this is where the two worlds collide, where, we have a researcher who does a lot of reading and we have a guy who does a lot of listening. And all I can say is yes. And I'm going to share what I know very soon. People keep asking, when's the new podcast coming? Well, I've chopped that and we are not doing a new podcast. We are releasing, I've been waiting for that, bro. We are releasing the original story on the confessionals. We're not going to try building a new podcast out of it. We're just going to do it right on the confessionals. Um, I'll, more details to come, uh, but let's just put it this way: there's gonna be a, a there's gonna be people are gonna be able to follow. Well, members will be able to follow the journey. Oh my gosh, you're gonna do it for the members? Yeah. The the initial the the actual initial interview that I talk about all the time that's gonna be on the platform for everybody to listen to. Uh, but as I go through the journey and unfold recordings, you know, sometimes it's gonna be five, ten, fifteen minute recordings. We're going to have an entire section for the members on the app. So um, anyways, all I can say is uh, when people hear that, I'm thinking we're going to release it in September. The the, the gen- I, I just keep calling it the Genesis story. I, I'm going to call it something else, but it's just the beginning, the, 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 the first story that, that got me on this. When people hear it, they're going to hear it. They're going to know what you're talking about um, and why I keep saying yes. So well, Tony. On. Little Easter egg, there is a homunculus in that story too, by the way. So in the story that you're talking about, the book that shall not be named, there is a homunculus and we can talk about it at the end, but this idea of we've always grown up being told to use our imagination, right? And I'm talking about the abyss, which is this intermediate world. They've always told us that that our, our, our mind over matter our mind creates reality, all these different things. Well, there's something called the mundus imaginalis. And this is a, a topic that I've been really dealing with and because it relates to John D and Edward Kelly, which, right, the, 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 the guy who introduced Enochian magic into existence. And they were interacting with entities on the other side. Now, the, re, the, the way that they were doing that was through scrying. Okay. And this mundus imaginalis, according to some researchers, there's d- different technologies that you can access that. Now, I still don't know if the Mundus Imaginalis, this intermediate world between reality and, and imagination, it's just in between. If we all have our own Mundus Imaginalis or if we all share it collectively and we're able to all tap into that. And the reason I say that is because one of the technologies in order to access that other realm, that dimension, right? Similar to Crowley. Crowley used it as well. He's scrying through the aethers, is scrying. And Shout out to the boys again from Kill the Mockingbirds. We, we have a show called Shadow Band Syndicate because we're Shadow Band. And we covered the origins, the occult origins of technology. And we, we went down a whole rabbit hole of that. But the idea that right, we're scrying at all times with our technology, our tech, that maybe perhaps has Nephilim or Enochian origins. Well, what if, again, we're talking about the Mundus Imaginatus and the ways of accessing that. And opening up portals for things to come through. Well, what if we're all collectively 
scrying right now with the use of technology and the use of our phones and manifesting these things from our mundus imaginalis into our reality and they're bleeding through our reality okay so the technology is like a sort of bridge or gateway like the gateway computer or whatever cern where where did the the internet originate at cern right the world wide web www www is 6662 i mean that's like a like a uh elementary conspiracy, but WWW is in the Jamatria 666. So I'm sure that they're I'm sure that they're good people at CERN. I'm sure that they didn't mean to do anything. They only have a statue of, I think it's Shiva or something doing the death yeah. dance. I'm sure that they're up to right. They're they're colliding matter together, trying to just do things, right? And then they show they show it to you in shows like Stranger Things. And that gun that opens up the portal is called the key. And if you think of Solomonic magic in Goetia, right, to interact with demons and entities on the other side, the keys of Solomon. So they put this stuff in these movies and in these shows, okay? The portal on that shows on a tree. Well, if you, if you look at Kabbalah and all these, the, the other side, the cliff off, which is the dark side of that tree is also a thing that leads into the upside down. So this is all in literature, Tony, but I believe that we are, we are all collectively scrying together whether and again back to this idea it doesn't matter if you believe it or not the intentions that went in to creating this technology were just those the origin of the modern day computer tony was in order to approve the existence of god and the guy who charles babbage who is the father of the modern day computer also was trying to summon the devil as a little boy okay so these are guys that have influenced our society and reality today who had other nefarious activities, even though it's all about intention. Maybe your intention, the listener listening to this, when you use your phone, you use it for school, work, whatever it is. But the guy who made that, the guy who was able to let that idea come into into society, into reality, had other intentions with it. He was trying to prove the existence of God through the use of technology. Okay. If you look at a circuit board and you look at Enochian tablets, they look similar. Okay, so a daemon in techno in, in programming is a little messenger that sends messages back and forth. You have all these different concepts, and although maybe, and that's the that's the powerful side and scary side of the occult and this magic with a K or otherwise, because they're able to implant these things even in our, in our own language, right? All the days of the week are named after Nordic gods, and they put these things in our language and in our technology and all these things that we use and interact with every day. And who knows what that that's doing to us on a spiritual level, right? And 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 what me, what we're carrying on for these magicians or sorcerers of the subconscious, as I like to call them. So, again, just just an idea, Tony, that maybe we're all bringing these things into existence. Some, not all, some, and we're tapping into other realms as we go along. Um, just just a thought, Tony. No, I, well, no, I think that. So it, the way you're we're we're painting the picture today uh especially with the information you're you're talking about society is built strategically it didn't just unfold randomly and we just get to this point it's strategically built and it's built in a way where our everyday lives could be part of the process of such things uh for instance, people that live in D.C., the roads they drive, what those dro- the, when you r- drive those roads, what do they trace? And you know the, the, the obelisk, like there's so much symbolism in your everyday life that you have no choice but to live through. Like there, what are you going to do? Not do Monday? You know, like kind of <laughs> have to, you know? <laughs> like, so, yeah. uh, I mean, it, it's, and that's why people can get so... When, when, especially when they first start learning about stuff, they, they get all in their, their head and they're just like, oh my, ah, ah. you know, it's just like, oh, breathe, breathe, you yeah. know? Uh, and that's why I always kind of come back to your God is more powerful than anything that these people are doing right now. And that's why it's mm-hmm. so important for you to recognize the spiritual realm that you live in and the ultimate authority within that spiritual realm. It's very complex. It's way more complex than what we have ever been taught and we're, we're learning just that. But at the end of the day, the ultimate authority in that realm is on your side if you choose to tap into that ultimate authority. 
And so uh, with that said, I'm going to backtrack to just something you said earlier that I just wanted to hit on because uh, I just had this conversation last night. Uh, people have already heard it by now, at least the members have, but I just had the conversation like less than 12 hours ago. I was here recording 12 hours ago. <laughs> you know, uh, I was talking with two guys, uh, Nick from Tales from the Grid Square, and he brought a guy with him named Isaiah. Isaiah was stationed on Fort Campbell in Kentucky, and he was part of an entire event that happened on the base where he saw a dog man and other people saw the dog man as well from other perspectives and vantage points. They're calling over the radio about a dog man on the base. And it's not the only time it's ever happened. He continues to tell a story where one of the other guys who I'm actually in a group chat with who just didn't come on to talk about it. I wish he would have. It would have been nice to have his perspective firsthand versus Isaiah retelling it. But he comes on and says that this other guy, Mac, who we're talking to, uh, he was, uh, a, I guess, like a, a, a some kind of group leader or something during training. And a dogman comes on the scene. Isaiah's not there. He's hearing this over the radio. Uh, at some point, radios all go down base wide. It, 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 like, it's unexplainable. They're brand new radios, brand new batteries, all go down at one time. And then they come back on and they work fine. But over the radio, they're calling out that this dog man is here. And what happened is this thing, they must have been near a tree line or something. I think he calls it the back 40. And it's where they do all their training. This thing grabs one of the soldiers and starts pulling him into the woods. And Mac pulls this guy back and this guy's leg gets all cut up. He shortly after this incident left the military. Um, but this happens at Fort Campbell a lot. Like, like it's not unknown. Uh, this guy that I'm talking to is now at another base where he teaches classes. And whenever he gets a new group of students in that come from Fort Campbell, he's like, who's my Fort Campbellites? They raise their hand. And he's like, who knows about the dog, man? And he's like 20, 30% of them raise their hand that they've had experiences with it. Um, back in the 1970s, there have been soldiers talking about this one situation where a dog man just ripped up things like crazy. Um, and so this all happens at Fort Campbell, which is not far away from the Bell Witch Cave, the Bell Witch Cave in Tennessee. And that's been described on this show by Martin Groves. At, I think he did it, did it in the Overtime or Member Show, uh, I believe. But we were talking about portals and things like that. And he said that the Bell Witch Cave has so much paranormal activity, it's been known to be called the hell or the, the portal to hell. And he said that it's also known that dogmen guard that portal to hell. And that's not far away from Fort Campbell. What's also not far away from Fort Campbell and the Bell Witch Cave is the LBL, where Dogman is, is just viciously going at people, uh, which we're going to be visiting here in the future. Uh, but... <laughs> Wish me luck, everybody. Uh, does, does, but, Tony, by any chance, does that make a triangle by any chance? Uh, it does. Uh, a, a little bit of a wonky triangle, I would say. But it, depending on where you go, because the LBL is so big, but you got um, Fort Campbell in Kentucky, right on the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. Then you got the, the Bell Witch Cave south of that. And then you got LBL uh, west of those two things. So it would be a triangle of some sort. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, go ahead and share what you're thinking along the, that angle of triangle. Because I did do a, an episode called the Tennessee Triangle that had that area in mind. That people can see it on the show art. I, I, I made the show art deliberately to have the triangle over certain specific areas. And so um, people can go check that out and give it a listen. Give me an, another download. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, the, the, the triangle is... The triangle is part of manifesting entities into like the, the magician can use a magical triangle to manifest an entity and have control over it. And I know you listen to that. that What's his name? I, for, I always forget his name. The guy you were listening to where he had a witch on talking about bringing dogmen into this reality. Oh, Shane, Tim Pool. Shane. Yeah. Shane Cashman. Or Shane. Yeah. So that, Cashman, well, yeah. and if, if you think about the occultic aspect of bringing these entities in, well, I mean, they're using the occult magic, whatever, necromancy, whatever you want to call it, they're using that technology to bring it into 
reality. So again, not I'm not saying that all dogmen are occult byproducts, right, of these rituals. Maybe some of them are, right? And and the idea that the government is interested in this sort of stuff, right? Maybe this is why we have national parks, right? You have that whole conspiracy that they're protecting things that are in these open areas. Because I've, I've been to the Everglades numerous times and it's a magical place. And people are like, oh, no, it's not. It's a magical place, bro. The What do they say? That the desert is the mansion of the devil. Or you have these open areas where the jinn live, right? These places of high strangeness. And it, it's got to do something. I've noticed, right? The 12 vile vortices around the world, the 12 devil's triangles, these are all places of high strangeness. You have the Bermuda Triangle being one of the more well-known ones. The Devil's Triangle over by Japan. You have the Mohenjo Daro, the South Atlantic Anomaly, all these different places around the world where the veil is thinner. And I think things are able to interact with us more freely, right? And people are able to tap into it. And, and these things are bleeding into our reality. Yeah, I don't know if we're all, again, collectively scrying together using our tablets, right? Tablets and tablets and magic are another thing. Our phones. You know, all these different frequencies that we're being bombarded with where these things are able to maybe for a second fizz in and fizz out of our reality, right? Or they are able to to sort of interact with that and they're able to blip in and blip out. Or so I don't know. So again, Tony, the, the more I look at this stuff, the less I know. Out of all the books I've read, I still don't know what's going on. And I probably won't ever figure out what's going on. But how like you said, if you walk in the light and you believe in God, and you're a good person. That's the key, in my opinion, to avoid. Because that's that's one of the things, unpopular opinion, but the more you look into the occult and all these different darker conspiracies, it just leads you to God. I mean, that that you know, it, it, it always tells you there's only one answer. It's God. And a lot of people don't like to talk about that because again, it's unpopular opinion, but that's my personal right endeavor. For, out of all the books I've ever read, and as long as you walk in the light, you're a good person, believe in God, you'll be okay. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> I got you, man. Yeah, I um, yeah, I'm not gonna go down that road. I'm, I was just gonna go down a little bit of a theological rant, but we're gonna let that one go for another day. Listen, we got Juan from One on One Podcast. Uh, Juan, before we wrap it up here, just tell people where they can find you, where they can find your work, because you're not just a podcaster. You do a lot of stuff, man, and I think it's a great opportunity for you to let people know because I think what just happened here. Over the last hour and a half, people fell in love with Juan. And so I, I think that they're going to want more of it. And so where can they get anything that you produce? So on any major podcast platform, you can find Juan on Juan Podcast. My website's tjojp.com. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Rumble, Twitter, TikTok. Instagram is my main account at the Juan on Juan Podcast. And yeah, that's pretty much where you can find me, man. I appreciate it. Don't you? I have um, on my website, I have a comic book. I have a publication, the, the little zine. I have a <laughs> homunculus owner's manual too, by the way, where it goes through the entire history of the homunculus from the start to the end. So I have that. You can check that out on my website. Dude, Again, that, no homunculus that looks like, guaranteed. <laughs> that looks like a chick track, man. That yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> that's awesome. I want one. I want one bad. Oh, send me, send me your, your, your PO box, Tony, and I'll send no, you no, some. You, I had, you, I, you, bro, when we were going to meet up, I had a whole thing for you and you flaked. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. I'm just kidding. So flake. no, like if you come back up, if you do come up, they'll bring them with you, uh, save some postage. But, um, yeah, th- th- listen, I had no control over it. Like, <laughs> it, like it, the, the, uh, the salon next door changed ownership the lady uh gave the salon to her niece and her niece comes in and renovates it and it just so happened they were renovating that weekend and holy crap it was because i was debating i was like can i get away with it and then I, when i when i told you i couldn't we couldn't record because it was gonna be too loud i was like shoot did i overreact and then it's just like Wah! i'm like oh shoot of course <laughs> they would pick that that weekend out of all the weekends that right. it could have been it had to be that exact but hey dude Things happen for a reason. Yeah. It was a good thing that they pushed it back because, like I said, I, I was able to dig deeper. And the, the, it's funny because my dad has been in, in Gatlinburg this past week, too. Really? <laughs> He's on vacation up there. So, uh, but yeah, we'll set something up and we'll make it happen. Dude, it's not a big deal. I still yeah, love man. you, bro. Oh, man. I, dude, after this conversation, 
I love you more. Uh, it's been <laughs> it's been great. Uh, but everybody, check them out. One on one podcast. Uh, very original, but not so original name. One on one. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but it's it's perfect. And uh, dude, you killed it today. I appreciate you being here, everybody. Thanks for listening to the show. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share this show, but take that stinking link, share it with everybody. And if you don't want to share it, if you don't like me, that's cool. There's a lot of other people in your life you don't like. So take the link and send the link that you of the guy you don't like to the other people you don't like to irritate them. Just do me. You can do that. Uh, but just share the show. Uh, haters are welcome. And until next week, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Bye. Trying to build a